the way to go. So, welcome to the afternoon session on biomass conversion to fuel. My name is Johannes Werger from the Pacific Northwest National Agency of Munich. I'm co-chairing this session with Karsten Siebel from Georgia Tech. It is my pleasure to introduce you to John Arbor for his keynote lecture on key questions, approaches, and challenges to energy today. John doesn't need any interruption. He has been president two terms here, so I'm refraining from that, and I probably spoke more than he had allowed me to do it. So without further ado, John. Shift in energy 
and chemicals within the United States. Uh, by 2020, experts are predicting 40% increase in world energy demand, with developing nations accounting for 80% of that increase. Long-term period of tight supply and tight demand is, is projected, and this will all increase uh, the demand for more and better catalysts as, and also as absorbents. Uh, energy intensive businesses uh, include petroleum refining, natural gas conversion, power generation, transportation vehicles, emission controls, uh, the production of chemicals, which also use a large amount of energy, and uh, the, the emerging businesses in biomass and solar conversion. <clears throat> in terms of energy needs for chemicals, uh, we see that by, by far 33% of the industrial organic sector. The uh, chemical sector uh, is a big consumer of energy. Uh, other big uh, consumers of energy include production of ammonia, ethylene, chlorine, and methanol in that order. Uh, in petrochemicals, steam cracking is the most energy intensive step. And we find that uh, energy uh, consumes about 20% of the total, I'm sorry, chemicals consumes about 20% of the total industrial energy consumption. Uh, and it also, as a result, provides a, a great deal of U.S. CO2 emissions. So, uh, really that's all by way of background, and this is really my outline slide, because if one really wanted to talk about energy, you'd have to go through a, very, uh, a long list of uh, topics. Uh, and in this case, I've broken them down by the sources, wind, solar, biomass, coal, natural gas, petroleum, etc. Uh, and in those areas, one has to address emissions control, transportation, improved devices, including coal voltaics and fuel cells. Having gone through the sources, you then look at storage, uh, capturing energy for all power, power use, especially in issues around solar and, and wind. And then the products that use energy, such as chemicals, agricultural needs, and transportation vehicles, and finally water. And each one of those bullet items is a lecture in itself. What I'm going to do is just address the ones that are underlined here, uh, solar, biomass, coal, natural gas, and uh, the application of uh, energy uh, to chemicals industry. Now, as uh, catalytic chemists, we're obviously interested to see where our science can be used in addressing problems in energy. And this is a short list. There, there are probably more on here that I haven't included. Uh, running from fuel cells to biomass conversion for this afternoon, uh, the solar splitting of water, water purification, and feedstocks for energy generation. I've not listed all those, but uh, there are certainly lots of opportunities which can be addressed by catalysis today. And so, in today's presentation, I'm really going to provide more of an overview. Uh, I'm going to look, focus on coal, biomass, natural gas, and solar. And I say not selling because I'm really focused more at where do we need to be thinking about some of these areas. So talking about limitations, talking about opportunities, uh, and particularly I'm going to spend more time on gas and solar and that will become apparent and, and why uh, as I get into the presentation. And finally I want to highlight the uh, issues and, and emphasize the opportunities as we get to the end. So in terms of non-oil options for energy, uh, coal, uh, in Kentucky, I had to put a couple slides up on coal. Uh, uh, there's a lot of growth in coal because of the uh, strong energy demands in both the United States and China. Uh, both nations have large long-term supplies of coal to meet future energy needs, um, and they seek energy independence and, and using internal resources for providing that energy. Um, However, using coal, as we all know, I think, comes with a much higher level of CO2 emissions whenever you use it versus something uh, which is a bit lower in CO2 emissions, such as natural gas. And then using coal also comes with other uh, uh, issues, if you want to call them that. Uh, coal being a fossil fuel with low hydrogen to carbon ratio uh, means that one has to add some form of hydrogen, uh, like molecular hydrogen, might be steam as a source of hydrogen, uh, the energy density is low, uh, and also you have more CO2 per kilowatt of energy produced than other fossil fuels. 
Uh, in addition, there are the undesirable impurities that one has to remove, such as mercury, sulfur oxides, NOx, ash, uh, heavy metals, selenium, and arsenic. Uh, the U.S. gets almost half of its uh, electricity from coal, uh, and as a result, we also get a great deal of environmental pollution with the numbers that are, are listed there. Uh, and as a result, uh, emission control uh, standards are established and it creates a business in itself, many of it, much of it which involves using catalysts to control those emissions. Uh, China, on the other hand, gets almost more than 90% of its electricity from coal, and uh, with the growth of that nation, we have seen China become now the largest emitter of CO2 in the world. Uh, so coal comes uh, uh, with some downside to it. Now, one thing I just wanted to point out, and that is that when you look at any, any energy source, you have to think about where it is versus where the customer is. And I just wanted to point this out in particular for coal, because in China, most of the coal is in the north. Uh, most of the customers are along its east coast, uh, so that there's a mismatch between the product and the consumer regions. And for something like CTO, coal to olefins, uh, the cost of transporting that coal uh, becomes a, uh, a factor in uh, the availability and also considering whether you use coal or some other uh, resource or, or some other uh, material, uh, not just for energy, but for the production of polymers, for example. In addition, when you then commit yourself to CTO, you've got to appreciate that you're getting lower yields versus other routes to produce some of those same old things. Uh, you're also using more water uh, versus other routes to produce olefins, and you're also producing more CO2 than uh, other routes to get to the similar olefins. So there are other issues that come along whenever you're using coal that you don't necessarily associate with other approaches. So that's really all I want to say about coal, and, and we're going to switch now to biomass. Um, and remind people again that the growth of biomass is really limited by the amount of cultivatable land. Um, certainly being able to convert waste materials would change some of the dynamics of that. Uh, the size of biomass clay will depend on the, uh, the region in which the biomass is available. Uh, the big target is cellulose and waste products, um, both of which potentially are serving different markets, the fuels and the chemicals businesses. Uh, the fuels have different market drivers than the chemicals businesses, so one has to look at what the sources of those products are from uh, biomass versus, say, from petroleum, and then think about the region in which that's being produced. Uh, Silos of biomass from ethanol requires also large amounts of water, uh, and there are challenges to also distributing uh, that biomass product, in the case of ethanol here, uh, to where the demand exists. So it, there is also a transportation issue uh, with biomass, just like we see with coal. <clears throat> now, again, just pointing out some of the things we need to think about as we go through these biomass presentations, and that is, you know, where you have that biomass and the route you're going to use, so these uh, regional supply issues that are going to control the price. Uh, there are transportation issues that have to be addressed in bringing that biomass to the marketplace. Um, there's also the product that you want to make, whether you want to make a specialty chemical or a commodity chemical. In the case of biomass, you're going to look at C5 and C6 products because that's what you're going to get from those biomass when you go through the first treatment processes. Uh, selectivity is going to be a factor and a concern. Availability around the year. You know, a chemical plant runs 24-7 in most cases, so that you have to think about what you're going to do uh, when you have a seasonal product that uh, may not be available in, in the wintertime. Um, there are also going to be waste and emission issues that you're going to have to address. There's certainly going to be less than those in coal, but the biomass does have you know, some objectionable elements to it which produced on a huge scale can also become significant. And there are going to be capital and investment costs new ones that are going to be make banks a little bit more uh, conservative in, in investing in new technology in this area. And you're going to have to look for very reliable um, and you're going to be addressing new technology hurdles along the way. 
And in addition, and I don't think there's enough of, are these mass energy and production cost analysis, what we call some LCAs, that people, I think, need to think more about as they advance and select the technology areas that they're focusing on. So those are really the areas that I wanted to talk about in the biomass and coal area. I want to spend amounts of my talk, time talking about shale gas and uh, uh, solar. In Kentucky alone, there are now over 6,000 shale wells operating. Across the United States to the, uh, from the west coast to the northeast, uh, there are some 19 different large ge uh, geographic basins with an estimated 35,000 shale wells. Uh, not until 1995, when hydraulic uh, fracturing technology was available, uh, did we begin to see a change in the level of production of uh, natural gas in the United States. And there are still concerns about a handful of wells that uh, have forced the U.S. to implement uh, tougher drilling rules to protect water supplies and reduce natural gas releases. Uh, this is a slide which I've sort of updated uh, in the years that I've been following this technology. The black representing the price of natural gas around the world in millions of dollars per B, uh, sorry, dollars per millions of BTU. Um, and we see in, uh, when you then compare it to the numbers in red, which are some select numbers for April of, of 2011, four years later, and to the uh, numbers in green, which I have at the uh, very bottom of the slide. Uh, dealing with uh, 2012 and today's price of natural gas, which is just about $4 a million BTU. So we see that uh, the U.S. has dropped from 720 to $414 to $1.98 and back up to uh, about $4. So there is some oscillation, but certainly not uh, to the, uh, the values that we saw early on. Uh, and when you compare it against prices in Europe or in, in Asia, uh, we're seeing much larger price swings and differentials uh, in, in the uh, just the last uh, seven or six or seven years now. So uh, this variability in the price of natural gas uh, has occurred uh, largely uh, by the discovery of, of shale gas within the United States. Uh, this is a, a nice uh, global view of potential shale gas reservoirs around the world. Uh, the yellow green color represents uh, large shale gas basins, which are known. Uh, now the question is, have they, can they be developed? Uh, and you see we not, not, not just the ones in the United States and Canada, but also in South America. Uh, South Africa has large reservoirs, uh, portions of uh, uh, Europe, and portions of China, and portions of Australia. Uh, so while we don't see those productions in those nations outside the United States and Canada, I think we will see some. Uh, it may not be in all the areas, and, and importantly, it's going to develop, it's going to take new technology, uh, which is going to be a spin-off of the existing technology. Uh, fracking has opened up a lot of new engineering approaches to getting gas from, from underground, and we can expect those approaches to be tweaked in the years to come, uh, depending on the geography of the the uh, reservoirs around the world. Now, what we have seen in terms of the dynamics is that North American shale gas output has altered the potential at our ability of the global market structure for natural gas. Uh, on that, the North American natural gas has forced Russia to allow a portion of its natural gas sales to uh, index spot natural gas prices, which was unheard of years ago. Uh, the gap in, in Japanese energy supply has been filled by increased availability of LNG because all of a sudden the United States doesn't need LNG. Uh, and so uh, it's been shifted into the Japanese marketplace. A wider availability of LNG has generated a lot of interest in upgrading natural gas to chemicals. And fracking technology has extended EOR and oil recovery uh, and impacted things like exports of petroleum from Nigeria to the United States. So it has had a lot of, of, of impact in a lot of different ways. So much so that I, I wanted to, I, I wrote an article recently which focused about this mega trend paradigm shift that has occurred because of fracking. Um, it has, and has played a significant role and will play an even more significant role in the future in terms of low carbon chemicals and as a fuel. Um, natural gas is a very clean 
not absolutely clean fossil fuel uh, compared to, say, coal or oil. Uh, world natural gas production has increased by 7% uh, in this figure here for 2010. The uh, U.S. is now the largest natural gas producer in the world, with shale gas accounting for 25%, and that number is only going to go up. Uh, world reserves of pipe gas grew for 50% or grew 50% from uh, the 20, 1990 to the 2010 period. The drilling technology is there, and improvements and strict enforcement will satisfy environmental concerns. Uh, catalysis has a very significant role here, and a key technology hurdle, I believe, is, is chemistry around activating the uh, CH bond and methane. Shale energy has trickle down effects. Uh, natural gas discoveries in Africa and Australia, on top of the impact of natural gas and ethane uh, from the United States, uh, will move more of the world to a global price for natural gas disconnected from the price of petroleum. What natural gas is gas that has liquid hydrocarbons in addition to uh, methane. Uh, there's also dry natural gas, uh, which has a very low level of those uh, same hydrocarbon, hydrocarbons. And currently, uh, that is being looked at as an export also, uh, ethane being much, uh, much more desirable hydrocarbon to the chemicals industry. But there's a lack of infrastructure. It requires different types of shipping uh, vehicles. It, it requires uh, new pipelines. Uh, and so uh, this will come, but it will be uh, longer in the process. Uh, there is, has been a move away from uh, NAFTA for making ethane because of the shale gas uh, uh, discoveries. Shale gas has, in some fields, as much as 8% ethane in it. So that ethane uh, is so much cheaper than making ethane from NAFTA that the price differential between NAFTA from ethane, from, I'm sorry, ethane from NAFTA is so different from uh, U.S. ethane prices now with uh, shale gas uh, recoveries. So we've seen that that has an impact around the world in terms of uh, other materials that are made from NAFTA because there's less attraction to, to a steam dragging NAFTA that thing. And there's also a higher demand for new fertilizer plants, also new methanol plants in the United States, which take advantage of the uh, cheap shale gas resource in the U.S. Natural gas is uh, also an alternative energy source. Uh, it's less carbon intensive than other fossil fuels, 30% less carbon than oil, and 60% less carbon than, than coal. Uh, and when used for power generation, natural gas uh, emits 60% less CO2 than coal, and emissions of other waste products such as mercury, sulfur, and nitrogen are certainly much reduced. Uh, our new energy sector of energy in the United States has uh, pointed out that shale gas has been partially responsible for the decrease in U.S. CO2 emissions. Uh, and uh, at the same time, it provides a bridge uh, for a low-carbon future and the time then that, that it's going to take to develop other renewable energy sources such as wind, solar, uh, and wind. Uh, just very quickly, a point on this slide. This is a, a, a chart that shows the price of uh, black crude oil versus brown natural gas and oil prices, which are put on an equal energy basis. So these are dollars per uh, a million BTUs. And you see what's happened uh, between the period of, of 97 and uh, 05 or so is that oil and natural gas more or less mirrored one another. So you saw the prices following one another. What we've seen very recently though is that uh, oil is going on off in one direction here and uh, natural gas is obviously going in the other direction. And that's really been driven by the price or the impact of shale gas production in the United States. Uh, for feedstocks, uh, we also see a big impact of shale gas, and this is a chart that I prepared uh, looking at dollars per million BTU in the vertical axis versus the, uh, the source of a feedstock, looking from L LPG all the way over to heating oil. The red numbers are representing 2012, the blue numbers 2004, and you can see that obviously most things have gone up in that eight-year period. Uh, except really for, for natural gas. Uh, coal has had a, a slight uh, increase of, and it's still very competitive as an energy source. It's just carrying around on the baggage with it. So natural gas has become very popular and very attractive as a feedstock as a result. 
So what we're seeing is that um, natural gas becomes a very powerful platform for chemical production in the United States. It's key to the production of ammonia, methanol, uh, and then as once we have methanol, we can take methanol and olefin to do olefins. We can also take methane to fish crops. We can take the ethane from uh, natural gas and make ethylene, and we can use that uh, uh, that same ethylene to make polyolefins, or uh, we can take even some of the propane and make polyolefins from that as well. So I think the, the biggest opportunity when I pointed out earlier about shale gas uh, is in if the Calcis community is thinking of it as a carbon extender. Uh, methane costs now are so much lower than uh, other uh, petroleum and coal, or, or other uh, fossil fuels certainly, that it has become a very attractive starting point if you want to make lower carbon number materials. Methanol has become a feedstock platform uh, for making, you know, methanol, I'm sorry, formaldehyde, MTPE, acetic acid, methylene macrolate, and uh, it's growing in terms of its conversion for biodiesel or EME or methanol olefins or methanol propylene. Um, we're also seeing that besides gasification to syngas, a CO and hydrogen, one can insert methane into higher hydrocarbons. Uh, potentially, and if there's a lot of opportunity which needs to be developed, uh, one can talk about things such as could we take not just methane and oxygen to things like formaldehyde, but could we take methane and methanol to ethanol? Uh, maybe we need to add some oxygen in that in order to generate water as a as a driver for the thermodynamics of the operation. Um, and certainly, it would be a lot cheaper uh, using methane than breaking down uh, coal petroleum by cracking to make lower carbon number of products. Now, we have to keep in mind that we need selectivity and yield if we're going to do this. Cautions with regard to shale gas. Uh, there's a lot of enthusiasm uh, based on projections that it's going to be around for 30 years for a particular well. This is still uh, being evaluated, but so far the wells are producing according to the projections. So there is a good deal of optimism that the U.S. will have uh, long-term supplies of, of natural gas this way. There come environmental challenges, such as controlling the emissions of natural gas around the wells, um, issues around water purification and uh, the impurities in, in some of the cracking fluids. Uh, the U.S. Has, has an established pipeline system and a market structure that makes it easy to move shale gas to many other commercial uses and applications. But that doesn't exist in most places around the world. And the U.S. government has also established a regulatory framework that, that is in place that, again, other nations don't have. So as the opportunity comes available for other nations to exploit this, they have to build these uh, mechanisms into their production operations. The U.S. also is very beneficial by the large amount of land that it has versus other nations. And so we have a very large land to well ratio, which isn't possible in many of the nations in Europe, for example. So opportunities outside the U.S. I think will come, but they're going to be delayed. Uh, it will take a longer period of time for that to develop. That's all I can say about the uh, uh, shale gas and focus now on solar. Uh, when we look at these various sources of uh, energies around the uh, to available to our Earth, uh, solar has by far a large percentage of uh, potential energy. Uh, 600 terawatts uh, is the practical achievable solar, according to some estimates. Uh, wind, uh, tidal, uh, geothermal, they're all in the 2 to 10 region. So even biomass is at 5 to 7. It just doesn't compete with the potential energy that we have with solar. And if you look at solar radiation striking the, striking the Earth, uh, there is enough solar striking the Earth in 40 minutes to satisfy the world's total energy consumption in one year. That's the type of potential that is out there. And we just need that kind of way of harnessing that. Uh, we can do that with solar reflectors today and global tank devices. Uh, and I've listed here uh, the various uh, uh, estimates for solar intensity conversion to kilowatt hours uh, per year uh, around the world. 
uh, certainly in London, uh, it's not as good as Los Angeles, but the point is it's still there. And there's, there's sufficient amounts to make it worth your while to recover that solar. Uh, and as a, as a point of reference, I've got the uh, average power consumption of various devices in, in our homes, TVs, refrigerators, air conditioners, and so you may not satisfy all your energy needs this way, but you can supplement your energy needs, which is what's happening. So, uh, solar is a uh, is undergoing a boom in terms of photovoltaic, photovoltaic devices. We've seen in, in, the, uh, in the last two decades now with the real takeoff of, uh, of devices being sold. Uh, different color bars represent, uh, in this case, yellow for China and Taiwan, green for the United States. Um, and this has sort of leveled a bit with the uh, recession boom that we've been going through and, and other market issues, but it certainly uh, does present a, a growing opportunity. And technology has done a lot in, our, in terms of driving down the price on the vertical axis here per, uh, per power unit uh, as, uh, as, as a function also of its old uh, cumulative capacity. And so solar has one of the few feet, it's one of the few sources of energy which is projected to continue to drop in price. And we see in, in this chart here, uh, now a couple of years old, but still I think clearly demonstrates it. When one looks at the cost in terms of cents per kilowatt hour over major U.S. cities, we see that uh, the solar price would be the yellow box, and the black bars represent the current price in terms of uh, cents per kilowatt hour uh, for that electricity. And so many major cities today are finding that solar is a convenient and attractive uh, energy resource uh, using existing photovoltaic prices. In uh, countries around the world, particularly the United States, Canada, and uh, uh, Canada, the United Kingdom, and Japan, we see uh, companies uh, being started up with uh, rooftop, rooftop devices, which are uh, provided at low cost and where the uh, owner agrees to lease the energy produced from the solar cells to the, to the electricity power grid. Um, in Japan, uh, you can buy uh, uh, electricity from the grid, uh, and you can also sell that. There are vehicles for doing that. Kyocera sells a battery storage system based on lithium at a fairly high price, but then uh, power is very expensive in Japan. Um, one city in Japan sells uh, rooftop leases uh, for uh, attractive prices when you look at it on a long-term basis. So really now, in summary for the, the uh, what I've been addressing this afternoon. If we look at these four uh, resources for energy, I've tried to point out some of the key issues that I'd like to see more work on. Coal in terms of handling spent CO2 in an environmentally acceptable way, uh, converting the emissions and ash to acceptable and useful products. In biomass, uh, widely different feedstocks around the globe that deserve attention in terms of how do you address wood versus corn versus um, other uh, cellulose and taste uh, sources. And one has to also think about the uh, potential of using waste material, which is a big opportunity around the world. Shale gas and natural gas is a platform for low carbon chemicals. Uh, it's happening already with methanol. Uh, and converting more of that natural gas into value added chemicals is a tremendous opportunity. In terms of solar, uh, one has to resolve the uh, storage of solar. Uh, there's also a great opportunity in the photo decomposition of water and an even bigger opportunity in the conversion of the CO2 to, to essentially carbohydrates, artificial photosynthesis, which uh, is an opportunity, I think, for many of the younger people in this room to, to begin thinking about. So when we, uh, winding down to my last two slides here, addressing energy efficiently as I titled this, energy efficiency clearly offers near-term energy reduction. And I'm using energy efficiency in a fairly broad term here, but what we uh, certainly have is an opportunity to use more energy uh, efficient equipment. Um, the difference between my green and black uh, items here is that green is our items which can be addressed by catalysis. And certainly improving process chemistry, creating new and more energy efficient processes, and reducing byproducts selectively offer a great deal of opportunity uh, for the catalysis of the community. Alternative energy approaches such as recycling waste, investing in renewables, 
creating new products, shifting to renewable feedstocks, using photocatalysis in, uh, use, in, the, in the solar energy spectrum, and also the abatement of uh, emissions. So, finally, just uh, summarizing, yeah, more sort of looking more specifically, things that I think one can think about in terms of addressing energy, and, and I think, again, provides a lot of potential for uh, financial support and industrial backing, uh, looking at fuel economy, uh, catalytic conversion of biomass and cellulose, uh, we talked about photocatalytic conversion of water, uh, emissions control in, in the refining business, as well as uh, with regard to global warming uh, emissions, and finally, catalytic conversion of CO2. Not addressed all of those, but uh, I'll leave that up and uh, be pleased to take any questions that you may have in the time that remains. Research uh, on methane inactivation. Uh, on all these uh, last, uh, I don't know, 40 years, what else do you do? What do you do differently? Yeah, uh, there certainly has been an awful lot of work in the past. Um, and I think using that or recalling that and learning from that, it's a tough problem, certainly. And it's not going to be one that's addressed or solved easily. But the value is enormous. The, the more we can get out of methane, besides just burning it for energy, the more value we're going to get out of the product um, and the, the value of the science and the technology. So that's why I talked about it as thinking about it as a carbon extender. You know, taking, I had one specific example of methanol to ethanol. So could you use methane to begin to incorporate carbon atoms into something like methanol? Uh, methanol has a lot of value now, but ethanol will also have a great deal of value, not just as a fuel uh, component, but in, in a variety of C2s in the chemical industry. Once you get to ethanol, you can get to a lot of new products. And uh, uh, right now, our, our, our technology, our science, is instead of for doing that, we, we tend to operate by taking petroleum and cracking it down. Uh, if you had a base, as you do in Brazil, of using ethanol, uh, you go on further in, in different ways. But the world doesn't think that way. The world thinks practically controlling. Brazil has adapted, and I think other nations would do that too. And I think that ethanol, I, I perceive, is a lot easier to activate and convert to C2, C3s than certainly methane or, or methanol. Yeah, thank you. Hear your, your views about uh, natural gas fracking technology. All you said is nice and beautiful, but there are many areas, uh, countries, particularly in Canada and Quebec, that are, they have forbidden the technique because they think that creates a lot of uh, geological damage and they they make the breakers to the to the future to process that you're starting. Yeah, I, I think. Uh, you know, fracking is, is new technology, and hydraulic fracking is even new. Um, it's a technology that was developed in a very short period of time, and there's certainly room for improvement. Uh, but it's very easy to justify that improvement because you're getting a very valuable product. So I think that there's a lot of incentive for doing this already, and, and it's happening. Um, but part of the problem is with, we're dealing with geology here, which is very different around the world. And I think for a while, people said, oh, well, we'll just use the same approach that we did in the United States and call it. And it doesn't work that way. And so they have to develop different types of additives for the hydraulic, hydraulic fluids. They have to get the equipment over there, which hasn't been available for the drill of thousands of wells that happen to be already positioned in the United States. So there's got to be a mindset. There's got to be enough uh, demonstration of reliability and safety I think for this to spread around the world. There has been a lot of press about water pollution and whatever. A lot of that's been just uh, challenged now, and I think we have to wait for the final reports to come out. But I think 
where people are beginning to believe that it's either a very small number or it's been incorrectly reported. So I think the jury is still out on that. But I, I believe personally that with uh, stricter controls in, in terms of emissions, monitoring, uh, safeguarding, uh, uh, patrolling, if you will, these, these facilities, you're going to be able to keep this more under control. And the opportunity is enormous. Uh, John, uh, of course you and I have been around for a long time, but I would like to hear your opinion about uh, the C1 chemistry pack and talk about the uh, oxidative coupling, which was of course in the heydays of the 90s, going to about 300 papers a year, and now it's coming back, and I would like to hear your opinion. Mm. Well, uh, yeah, it, it, again, Another tremendous opportunity, but people have spent um, a lot of time, a lot of effort, and there are some, you know, significant issues which need to be addressed. And you know, people talk about engineering solutions and whatever, and and you know, I I think there are probably other ways to think about not just that, but other approaches beyond selective oxidation. Um, I don't have any immediate answers here, or I'd be back in the lab, or I'm a rich man, but. Uh, all I'm saying is the opportunity is there in terms of payback and value to be doing this. One, one last John, yeah, thanks very much for a nice presentation. Um, fuel cells, you mentioned it. With all this natural gas available and all the difficulties we saw with power generation and power going down in all the storms, don't you see or do you see any evidence that the natural gas will be converted to hydrogen to operate fuel cells? Yeah, I think that's certainly one opportunity. Uh, hydrogen certainly would be a valued product from the methane. Uh, however, there are many other value-added products that you can get. Um, it's a matter of investment, too, I think, in terms of you know, where do you need that hydrogen, what the customer is, what their, their volume demand is. And it, it becomes a very specialized you know, look in terms of who it is, what your customer is, and, and what they're seeking. But certainly, it's an opportunity, and, and I would think that you know, people are already piggybacking on that, that approach. Uh, it's certainly one, but I think there are lots of others. Okay. We have to move to the next presentation. Let's thank you all again. The next presentation is going to be a contribution.